So this um, webinar today is on the one portion of uh, Timber Connection uh, and one important portion is uh, explaining the European yield model. So here. So during the presentation, I will cover just the, the big picture explaining why this model was developed. Then I will uh, cover the different failure modes and how we determine the, the resistances. Um, then I will explain some of the intricacies of uh, what happens when uh, we go beyond the double shear cases, which typically is uh, referred to in um, national standards. And then I'll go over design process recommendations and um, there's two examples at the end if we have time. One important thing is that the European model is not the only uh, tool that needs to be used to design timber connection. Um, this webinar will not cover the issue of brittle failures. So it's only for the ductile failures. So a very brief history. Um, the European yield model was first developed by Johansson's in 1949, uh, but it kind of uh, was left behind uh, and it was further popularized by um, Hans Larsen uh, from Denmark in the early 1970s. It was first introduced in the Euro uh, Eurocode 5 design standard, then it made its way uh, into the North American standards uh, using simplified version. It's important to note that when this was first introduced, um, you know, mainframe computers were the only tools that were available um, in terms of uh, computing power other than your desktop, um, you know, calculator. So a lot of uh, different formulas were uh, introduced. The big picture, is that the EYM was developed to predict the resistance of timber connections for dowel type fasteners, where there's a combination of fastener yielding and or timber embedment. So it is a tool that predicts the ductile connection resistance, but will not be able to give any indication of how ductile that connection will be. So it only gives the resistance. So it's applicable to uh, for bolts and treaded rods, for dowels, for coach screws or lag screws if you're in North America, for nails, wood screws, and self-tapping screws. It also is applicable to predict timber rivets ductile failure modes. The European yield model predicts the resistance of timber connections where the fasteners are working in shear. So it does not cover any other uh, application. So, and, and again, it does not cover or does not uh, predict anything where brittle failures will occur. So this is an example where the EYM would be able to predict the resistance. You have a glue lamp member and four bolts that were loaded by steel plates on the outside. There's a significant amount of embedment and the um, onset the, of this um, ductile connection will be predicted by the EYM. The main characteristics of the model are that the, the material embedment strength. So when I say material, it can be timber, it can be glue lamb, it can be CLT, it can be LVL, it can be anything. It can be steel, it can be concrete. Um, and the other portion is the thickness of the fastener and its yield strength and diameter. 
The model assumes that the materials have an elastoplastic behavior. Now we'll cover the failure modes and their resistances. So in um, most um, design standards, the two main cases are for the single and double shear joint. So the one on the left, the uh, fastener is sheared in one location and in the one on the right, the there's a shear um, plane here and another shear plane there. So double shear plane. For any other situation where you have more than two shear planes, um, you as a designer will have to consider that it is a double or um, double shear plane, but there's two of them. So in this case, we would consider that this would be a double shear plane joint and you would have another double shear plane joint here and then you just multiply uh, the um, double shear resistance by two. So let's first start uh, looking at the single shear failure modes. Uh, for this case, there are six possibilities and you will see these uh, diagrams shown um, throughout the presentation. So in this first one, we have, okay, so one of the member is this one, the other, uh, so there's a two member uh, joint and we have a fastener. In this one, the fastener is not deformed, but the embedment failure is on this uh, member at the bottom. In uh, failure mode B, the embedment failure is in the top member. So no deformation on the fastener itself. In this um, failure mode C, the um, fastener does not deform, but there's embedment failure in both of the members. And you would, one would assume that, okay, in this case, in the top case, the, uh, you know, the, the bottom member is, is like butter, so it's uh, very, very weak uh, density wise. So it, its embedment is very low in comparison to the rest. Um, and that's where most of the movement goes. In um, failure mode B, it's uh, the top member that is like butter and all the deformation goes into that, uh, in, into that member. In uh, failure mode C, both members are probably have more or less the same thickness, the same embedment, but we have a fastener which is extremely rigid and does not want to bend, does not want to deform, so it um, crushes the fibers um, at the top and bottom of the top member and the same likewise for the bottom member. In the next two failure modes, failure modes D and E, uh, we have um, members that are uh, dissimilar in um, characteristics, uh, but also a possible um, um, fastener which has a low resistance in comparison to the uh, resistance of the top member. So in this one, we have a uh, fastener that has the form. So there is a plastic hinge in the uh, fastener around the top member and the um, failure mode E is a uh, mirror image of the um, failure mode D and the uh, plastic inch in the fastener is in the um, vicinity of the uh, bottom member. In the last failure mode of the single shear um, cases, we have two plastic hinges. So uh, in this case, we have a combination of embedment, so crushing 
of the timber fibers in the bottom of the top member and uh, crushing of the fibers in the top of the bottom member and a plastic hinge at this location and a plastic hinge at that location. So two plastic hinges and uh, combined with some uh, embedment failure in the um, in the two members. In the single shear case, it doesn't matter which uh, you define as member one or member two. And you, know, you will see in the equations that you have uh, the embedment for member one and the thickness of, for member one. It doesn't matter because this will be all cut up. Um, so this, these are mirror image of the two. Uh, this one covers for um, cases where the two characteristics, uh, member one and two, are taken into account. D and E are mirror images. Uh, so they will cover if you have um, uh, two members that are the same, uh, both will give you the same um, same resistance and the last one uh, will cover the general case. So it does not matter uh, which member, the top or the bottom, you define as member one or member two. For the double shear case, the, um, there are four failure modes. And the first two, um, there is embedment uh, in the timber members only and no deformation in the fastener. So in the top one, in failure mode A, all of the embedment uh, is occurring in the outside members. In uh, failure mode B, all of the embedment or crushing of the fiber is occurring in the middle member. In uh, member or failure uh, C, there's two plastic hinges, so uh, one at, at this location, the other one here, and there's combination of embedment uh, failure in member C and member, uh, uh, sorry, the middle member, uh, top and bottom, and also top and bottom of the exterior member. In the last one, failure mode D, there's occurrence of four plastic hinges. So two in the uh, center of the, uh, uh, the joint and one in the outside. So you've got double curvature in, um, in the fastener. In failure mode C, there's only single curvature. And you'll see this in the example, how it looks. For the double shear case, it is important to define the outside member as member one and the inside one as member two. The load displacement relationship that you can expect uh, will be um, elastoplastic type of behavior for cases where the embedment governs. Um, so no plastic hinges in any of the fasteners. And if there are plastic hinges in, um, in the fastener, then um, you will get, uh, we will see a first onset of yielding and then it's going to continue until there's the ultimate um, resistance of the connection is obtained and it's basically uh, you know embedment failure of the uh, timber um, over its entire thickness. So in this case we have uh, it was that was for a steel wood steel connection. The member was about 130 uh, millimeter thick uh, and it was loaded by steel plates on the outside and there was plastic hinges here. So you see the on the outside the uh, curvature they're going up and after a significant amount of deformation, the curvature um, is indicating that there was plastic hinges in the uh, middle of the member. 
and you would see uh, that type of um, uh, behavior. So in this case, uh, plastic inches on the outside, very close to the steel plate, and then plastic inches on the inside. And because there's been a significant amount of deformation in the order of 20, 25 millimeter deformation, the entire thickness of the uh, glue lamp member uh, is developing embedment failure. In this case, it's a wood steel wood uh, connection. Uh, we can see that there were uh, plastic inches very close to the steel plate, so curvature facing down. And uh, because there were, again, a significant amount of, of deformation, curvature going up for the outside timber members. So another one where we have four plastic hinges. So in terms of resistance prediction, the uh, what we do is we um, we have our overall connection or joint resistance, which is given by the minimum yielding resistance of a single fastener. So this so the small n sub uh, alpha y u is the resistance of one fastener uh, yielding. And this has to be multiplied by the number of shear planes in the, in the joint and the number of fastener in that joint. So this n sub uh, alpha y u is for one fastener. For the single shear cases, uh, the equations are shown on the right. So uh, if you take the, uh, in this case, um, we have the resistance as F sub one theta uh, times the diameter of the fastener times the thickness of member one. So. If you see the diagram showing the embedment failure at the bottom member, it means that in this case, uh, I've defined member one as my uh, bottom uh, member. So in this case, it's simply um, the resistance is equal to the um, embedment um, the resistance in MPA times the uh, diameter times the thickness, so it's sigma times A, so um, basically sigma equals P over A. We're just taking the uh, basic uh, pressure formula uh, equals uh, the resistance over the area, and we rearranged it. So in equation um, for failure mode B, it's the same thing. We have failure, embedment failure in the top member, member two, times the bearing area, meaning the, the diameter of the fastener and the thickness of member two. It's getting complicated uh, quite fast uh, as we go along for the other fasteners. I do not expect anyone to calculate these equations uh, by hand. Everything used um, should be done using spreadsheets or MATLAB type of uh, design tools. Uh, once you have these tools developed, it is very fast to come up with the uh, resistances. Uh, but I definitely do not expect people to do this by hand. It's too tedious and uh, there's too much iteration involved. So in this one, we have the, uh, the embedment of member one, the thickness of member one and the diameter of the fastener, and then thickness of two, member two, and uh, so on. We don't see the embedment of member two, and that's because it's disguised into this beta. Beta is the ratio of uh, the embedment of one and two. So it's gonna come up later on uh, where this uh, definition comes up. Uh, same thing for um, failure mode D. We have more or less 
the same uh, F1 and T1 and D and beta um, that comes up and um, in a different form. And one can see that for uh, failure mode E, the equation is more or less in the same, except that we have T1 and T2. In this case, because there is the onset of plastic hinges, the MY uh, variable comes up, and this will take into account, you know, the resistance of the fastener. In the last equation for failure mode F, uh, we have the um, embedment of member one, the diameter, and the uh, resistance to uh, plastic hinges and the beta. And you will note that I haven't talked about the term on the right, but for all of these cases, we have a potential increase in um, the left term, and this is the rope effect. So and I'll explain the rope effect a bit uh, further down the road. For the double shear, we have our four equations. And again, for the top two, where embedment of the timber material is uh, the only uh, consideration, we have F1 times the uh, area, so bearing area, the diameter times the thickness of the outside members. And in this case, we have the embedment of the middle member times the bearing area, and we divide by two. And in this case, the reason why we divide by two is because we will multiply by um, NS equal to two. There are two shear planes, and we just want to make sure that we consider the um, thickness or the uh, where well, we need to divide by two because we only have one member in this case. For failures C and D, uh, as for the cases for single shear, we have the embedment of member one and the thickness of member one and the um, MY variable and the beta uh, ratio plus the rope effect. And for the um, failure mode D with the four failure, uh, four plastic hinges, something similar to uh, the uh, single shear case. Um, and again, uh, embedment of member one, uh, the diameter and the, um, uh, the uh, fastener plastic hinge resistance. The resistance predictions of, uh, of using these equations is quite reliable. Um, in all of the tests that I've done, I've seen variations of plus or minus 5%. So, and this um, variation really depends on the density variation of uh, the material. The usually the um, variability of the uh, fastener is quite low. The, uh, uh, the diameter of the fastener is quite low. Uh, possibly one thing to be um, to be aware of is that if you are uh, designing a connection for uh, to take uh, some ductility, and you specify a, a connection or a fastener grade, you have to ensure that this fastener grade is used on site. If it is not used, uh, if it's, um, you know, somebody is making, trying to making, uh, making you a, a favor and he's delivering a grade higher, thinking that it's going to be acceptable, is going to throw off your prediction and it's not good. In the equations, the uh, beta value is the ratio of the embedment uh, resistance of member two over the embedment of member one. So that's by definition, it's how it is. For the fastener yield moment, um, the, uh, the M sub Y uh, resistance is given by 0.3 uh, 
uh, times the uh, ultimate uh, resistance of the fastener times the uh, fastener diameter over um, at a power of 2.6. The diameter has to be in millimeter and the embedment or the resistance of the fastener is an MPA. For with regards to the material embedment resistance, we have this Ankinson formula where um, the uh, in a general <clears throat> presentation, you have F sub I comma theta. The I is either member one or member two. And theta is for either your, um, if it's your uh, load, if your fastener is loading your member at a given angle, uh, typically the embedment will be uh, measured um, at a parallel to grain, so at an angle of zero or perpendicular to grain at an angle of, of 90. The, uh, the, this is the Atkinson uh, formula that is applicable for different uh, loading uh, angles in, in timber. It's modified by the uh, phi factor, the material reduction factor. Um, so for in the next version of the New Zealand Timber Design Code, this is proposed to be uh, 0 0.8. Uh, we have our load duration factor K1 and our service condition factor K12. Uh, I believe in the next version, this is going to be K15. Um, so um, it is um, the uh, the load duration and the service condition is modifying the embedment formula only. So it does not apply to uh, the other ones, the other factors. The uh, as I said, the um, embedment is uh, measured experimentally. Usually it's done by uh, on the different materials and it's done for different diameters of fastener. OK, the embedment is um, a function will vary with the diameter of the fastener. So you will see this in um, equations in the different design standards throughout um, throughout the world. For um, radio, the pine, timber, and glue lamb, and LVL, these were um, obtained by uh, experimental tests, and you can refer to this. The uh, rho is the density character characteristic density of the material in kilograms per cubic meters. For if you have other materials in your equation, so if you have a steel wood steel connection or wood steel wood, uh, the embedment is used uh, is determined using the uh, that formula. So it's the your uh, 0.9 phi s value uh, multiplied by 3.2 uh, multiplied by the ultimate um, resistance of the plate. So you would get uh, that type of uh, uh, value. So 1296 MPA, if it was using a um, steel plate with a uh, ultimate resistance of 450. If you are connecting timber to a uh, concrete portion, um, regardless of the concrete strength, uh, if you're using 125 MPA, as an embedment uh, resistance times the uh, phi C of 0.6, uh, that will give you uh, reliable and conservative resistances for these types of joints. Um, and if it's more than 20 MPA, just um, you don't have to change, keep on using the uh, 125 MPA value. Now, going back to the rope effect, uh, the rope effect is a um, effect where if you have the onset of yielding as a result of a plastic inch formation in the fastener and you keep on deforming the, um, the joint, the resistance will grow. 
just because at first the um, the fastener has a certain length, it deforms, it wants to elongate. This elongation will bring the outside members together. There's going to be a component in the fastener that will increase the lateral resistance. So this um, rope effect is the minimum of either a portion of the left term of the EYM. So uh, for the double shear case, I'm showing the case where you have four plastic hinges. The uh, equation that was presented is showing like this, plus the rope effect. So uh, depending on the type of fastener, um, you will be given a uh, percentage of the left term. So this portion that you're allowed to have as the rope effect maximum value. The also the, the other uh, component of this rope effect uh, depends on the fastener tensile strength. Um, and that can be the shank failure. If you have a, um, a screw, it can be a pull through. If you have a wood, wood, wood connection with screws, or if you have a um, bolted connection with a wood, wood connection, uh, the bearing resistance under the washer is also one possible mode of failure that you need to consider. So um, this rope effect is the minimum of these three uh, potential failures, but the design standard states, okay, depending on the type of fastener, this um, there will be a maximum percentage that this uh, value is given. For typically for a bolted connection, this is 25%. The rope effect is only available if uh, there's a deformation in the fastener. So that's why you don't see it in uh, failure modes A and B for uh, the double shear. Um, because there is no elongation of the fastener. Also, there's no rope effect for dowels because the dowels, there are no restrictions at the end of the dowels. So moving on, um, for thickness deformation, if you have a single shear you're, um, and you involve the uh, embedment of the entire and uh, the entire thickness of your member simply for the first case your t1 and your t2 and your uh, double shear case your t1 for the outside member and your t2 if you have a wood member uh, wood 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 connection again uh, fairly simple if you start being uh, architecturally uh, savvy and you uh, embed me the uh, bolt or fastener head into the um, thickness of the member, then your embedment is reduced and you have to account for this in your calculation. If your dowel does not extend to the outside of your member, you have to take that into account and use T1 as the portion of the dowel which is embedding or crushing, pushing on the timber member. In the case where you have a, um, a two knife plates inserted in a, uh, a timber member, you have to position these uh, plates uh, so that you have your T1A and your T1B uh, more or less equivalent. Otherwise, you will have to use the minimum of the two. So there's a bit of a judgment call here to, uh, to do. Uh, if you look at this example, um, the knife plates were inserted more or less at thirds of uh, the thickness, and, uh, but, and the dowels were extended to the outside, meaning that the, we have two double shear joints, uh, but the T1 outside is greater than the T1 inside. So that's not a, the, it's not an optimal positioning of these uh, two knife plates. 
uh, in this case. So it would be would have been preferable to have it uh, more on the outside. Also, be aware of the issue with dowels and uh, yielding failure mode. So if you have uh, the case on the right where there's uh, only dowels, after a certain amount of deformation, there's going to be an outside loading component that will uh, force the uh, members to split and you could have premature failure of your joint. So that's why uh, you will see in a lot of um, dowel joints uh, the use of bolts as well, just to prevent the um, splitting of the member. So you would see this in this um, uh, two wood steel, two wood steel wood joints. So in this case, the uh, knife plates were inserted um, at um, place to uh, optimize the uh, the joint itself. So this portion is more or less similar to this one, and there's a lot of uh, dowels that are uh, being used. Uh, but in this case, uh, there is. Uh, uh, bolted connection, bolted uh, bolts that have been used to prevent the opening of the joint. Now, the outside member on this um, double shear joint is a bit thicker, and I suspect that uh, the um, the uh, dowels do not extend to the outside in this case. Beyond the double shear case, so what happens when um, we go and there's more than two knife plates as shown in the uh, bottom right picture? So we have our case where we have one shear plane, two shear plane, and uh, here we have four shear planes. In this case, uh, we have six shear planes. Uh, but we have to be careful. There's some failure modes that are impossible to occur. So that's the case for our double shear plane um, uh, failure modes. Uh, so we have two joints with NS of two. So that's how we design this uh, connection. Um, and then we can, you know, do the extension of the top one, failure mode A. We would uh, potentially have something like this, the top one. So again, we're not changing any of the configuration. But for failure mode C, if we extend this to our double, our two double shear joint, we see that we have something here which is not compatible. Uh, for failure mode D, we have compatibility. We're not changing anything. So in this one, we see that in order to have failure mode C in our two double shear joint, we would need to have an extra plastic hinge uh, to have uh, to make this possible. So this is a contradiction to uh, our assumption or to our extension of the multiple shear joint, and we can uh, omit KC in the calculation. So we're just uh, saying that it is not possible. So this process can be applied for any cases of increasing uh, shear joints. So in this case, we have three knife plates. Um, and again, we have uh, failure modes A, B, and D that would be uh, possible to uh, be considered. Uh, and again, in this case, the outside member is thicker. It's because there has been a um, plug. Uh, so the dowel has been extended to a certain amount and then plugged and then uh, a steel plate put in with intermescent paint. Uh, you can appreciate uh, in this case what you need to do. Uh, four knife plates, a lot of dowels, um, and in this case, um, I would suspect that it is a compression joint only. There may be some tension, uh, nominal tension applied on this joint. Uh, but this is a photo from a European um, 
European uh, connection and uh, was designed and fabricated before European dictated the use of bolts to prevent uh, splitting of the member. Some of the design process uh, recommendation. So after the member sizes are, and grades are selected, one would uh, select the bolt size. Uh, and from this, uh, you can um, determine the uh, F1 and F2 uh, using the character, characteristic density and the appropriate K1 and K12. Uh, and after this, you uh, determine your possible yielding failure modes and you take the minimum value. And from this, um, you would uh, determine the number of bolts required. And from this, you will um, set your possible layout, your configuration layout, one row, two row, your spacing and so on, size of steel plate. And then you check if your resistance is adequate. You will be able to determine you know, how many, uh, if you want two rows, you may want to go with uh, even number of uh, bolts or whatever. Um, using your spacing, you will need to determine your brittle failure resistances. Uh, that's not covered in this webinar, but that's going to be an important step. And you may want to change your spacing and your layout uh, if you want a ductile failure mode and your uh, brittle fail mode is governing. If the resistance is still not adequate, you may need to change your bolt size. Um, and I caution you, uh, bigger is not necessarily better as the volume of wood required will increase. Um, another option would be to try adding a shear plane. Uh, I'm just going to go over the first example. Obviously, if you want to download the um, the slides, uh, the second um, example will be uh, included. So it's a case of a steel wood steel uh, connection. The uh, load is uh, applied uh, to radial pine glue lamb, GL10 135 by 270. Um, it's a steel um, side plate, six millimeter in diameter, 20, we're using 20 millimeter bolts. And uh, with end distances, end distance of 8D, uh, um, in row bolt spacing of 5D and a 5D row spacing. The load is applied uh, from the load combination of permanent and imposed. And the question would be, what is the yielding failure of this, uh, uh, this joint if we're using two rows of three? So member one is the uh, outside steel plate. Uh, we determined that um, the uh, embedment is uh, 1296. So, and the um, embedment for the uh, glue lamb member is um, 0 0.8 times uh, the formula for the glue lamb and timber. So 0 0.072 times the characteristic uh, density of glue lamb uh, GL10 at 415 kilogram per cubic meters. Um, and we have to modify by uh, the term in the bracket by the 20 millimeter diameter. And because it's um, permanent and imposed, our load duration factor of 0.8. So we end up with a um, F sub 2 value of uh, 18 MPa. Now this connection is loaded parallel to grain, so it's F1 uh, 0, so uh, directly uh, we do not have to uh, consider the perpendicular to grain resistance. We have it directly. Our beta value um, is by definition F2 over F1, so 0 0.0139. And our M sub Y with our um, diameter and uh, fastener characteristics is 289,640 Newton millimeters. 
It has to be Newton millimeters to put into the EYM equations. If you are using any other units, you will not end up with the correct answer. The first um, failure uh, we consider for the embedment of the bolt in the uh, steel plate, we get 155.5 kilonewton per shear plane. The value you will get for the N sub alpha YU is in Newton, so you will get 155,000. Okay, so you need to divide to get kilonewtons. And for the embedment or the resistance of the second failure for embedment of the bolt um, in the glue lamb is 24.3. Um, now, in for failure mode C, uh, we determine the first term on the left at 17.8, and we um, look at the rope effect um, contribution. The uh, tensile capacity of the bolt is estimated at 75.4. An estimation of the bearing resistance under the steel plate is 21.7 and the um, last term is the left term of uh, of the equation so 17.8 we're just replicating this portion it's the uh, term that governs so as we divide it by four and we end up with 22.2 kilonewton per shear plane per fastener for the uh, last failure mode um, failure mode D, we do the same thing. So we end up with a 20.3 kilonewton. And again, the same three components. Again, the 20.3 left term that governs, and we end up with 25.3 kilonewton per shear plane per fastener. So uh, in this case, it's uh, equation C that governs at 22.2. We have six fasteners and we have two shear plane. So the um, yielding resistance of this two, um, two rows of three fasteners, 20 millimeter um, diameter fasteners would be 266.9. Um, I won't go over the second example. It's a wood, wood, wood connection where the members are loaded. Um, the center member is loaded parallel and the center, the side members are loaded perpendicular. But you can follow the slides. It's fairly regular, uh, fairly, um, fairly straightforward. And you end up with a uh, re yield resistance of 45.6. So in summary, uh, the European yield model will give you a reliable resistance uh, assessment of the potential ductile failure modes, uh, but it will not tell you how ductile this connection is. Uh, for the other point to remember is that if you have more than two shear planes, or um, if you have connections, uh, with, uh, you know, NS greater than two, uh, some failure modes can be omitted. And as a designer, you have uh, the responsibility to do this for compatibility of deformation. And the last point is that the EYM is not, okay, capable of predicting the resistance of brittle failure modes. I will, um, conclude at this point, and if there are any questions, I'd be more than welcome to answer them.